Thank you all so much for coming this evening. We're super excited about this lecture and glad to see everyone here. I know a couple people have class um, at six, so if you absolutely have to leave, we understand. But I want to just introduce myself, and we'll start with a couple announcements, and then I'll um, introduce our guests tonight. I'm Linda Samuels. I'm the interim director of the College of Architecture and Graduate School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture and Urban Design. I'm also the chair of Urban Design, so it's a busy year this year. Um, this week, in addition to this lecture, I just want everyone to know on Thursday night, we have the kickoff for the Informal Cities Workshop. So James Rojas and John Kemp will be here, also in this room, also at 5.30 on Thursday for the kickoff for that series. They are focused on Latino urbanism. They're coming from Los Angeles. Um, that is a three-day event. It is a one-credit class if you're still interested. I think we still have some spots open. Um, in addition, I just want to shout out to our student hosts for today. Um, Holly Rising from the GAC, the Graduate Architectural Council. Kevin Corrigan from ASLA. I think they're both here. If you guys could wave. Um, thank you both. We're trying to set up our guest lecturers with a studio and with students who are representatives from the student organizations. So um, this is a new thing we're trying so that the guests can spend more time with our students in the studio. Um, also, just thank you, for Bruce Lindsay hosted today. Uh, our guests were able to go into his course for a couple hours and engage students. Um, we should have a couple representatives from our other student organizations here, and I just want to thank them for being here and being a part of our student and learning culture, and um, that would be NOMAS, National Organization of Minority Student Architects. I don't know if, it's, if Alexis is here. ASC, Architecture Student Council. Emma, Katie, Ariel, um, AIAS, Heather and Miso, and also um, Abraham might be here from GAC. But uh, we just want to recognize that Thursday is often a time that you all get together and um, spend time together. And we had a lecture. We have a lecture this coming Thursday, but we still hope you'll come and spend time together after this lecture in the reception and spend time together after that lecture in the reception. Uh, we recognize all you guys do for the school and um, take time to get to know your student organizations. We've started doing something after the lecture, and you'll see it pop up at the end. You, we will see a QR code come up after the last slide. Uh, we're using that QR code as a way to just uh, gauge attendance. So if everyone could fill out the survey, scan the QR code and fill out the survey. In addition to that, if you're getting extra credit for a course, or if you're getting continuing education credit for the AIA, you also do that through the QR code. So that will be on the screen after the lecture. Um, a little bit about this particular lecture. So this is an endowed lecture. It's supported by Steve Abend and his family. So the Aben Family Visiting Critic Lecture was established in 2004, and that was in honor of Professor Leslie Lasky. Steve Aben graduated from the WashU School of Architecture in 1962 and went on to have an exemplary architecture career in Kansas City. The Aben Family um, Visiting Critic Lecture provides the opportunity for prominent architects to visit WashU meet with students, and share their work with the Sam Fox School and St. Louis communities. So we're grateful to Steve and his family. Steve wasn't able to join us tonight. He is still in Kansas City. Um, we're grateful to Steve and his family for tonight's lecture and the opportunity to bring Weiss Manfredi here to discuss their work. So thank you to Steve and his family. And now we're thrilled to welcome Marion Weiss and, and Michael Manfredi to speak tonight as the Abin Family Visiting Lectures this year. So a little bit about their firm. Weissman Frady Architecture Landscape Urbanism. As should be obvious in the firm name, the firm is at its core interdisciplinary, and their website states, as public and natural realms are continually eroded, Weissman Frady believes architecture could, could, should concern itself with the whole of the built environment. By intentionally drawing from and contributing to the systems that are intrinsic to a place, our projects are evolving experiments in the creation of a more elastic definition of architecture, one that connects the loose ends of art, landscape, infrastructure, and ecology to create new forms for public engagement. At the core of the work is the commitment to urban resiliency and public space 
as exemplified in projects such as Olympic Sculpture Park, which was recognized by Time Magazine as one of the top 10 architectural marvels. Makes it kind of sound like a superhero. The Brooklyn Botanic Garden Visitor Center and Hunter's Point Waterfront Park are also exemplary of their work. These projects demonstrate progressive ecological, architectural, and infrastructural frameworks that revitalize urban space. And they are what I call in my book, next generation infrastructure projects, which means they are ecologically conscientious, they are multifunctional, they are socially productive, they work across disciplinary and agency boundaries, and they are driven by design. In addition to a long list of current projects from India to MIT, including an international competition to reimagine the master plan for the world-renowned and very sticky problem of the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles. Weissman and Frady are also designing the new arts and sciences building here on campus, which maybe we'll see a little bit about. And that is across campus between Olin and Graham Chapel. In addition to this hugely successful practice, the co-founders also write, create exhibitions, and teach. Marion is the Graham Chair Professor of Practice at the University of Pennsylvania, Stuart Weitzman School of Design, and a woman in architecture design leader, according to Architectural Record. And Michael Manfredi is a senior design critic at Harvard University and a winner of the Paris Prize. The firm's work has been shown at the Museum of Modern Art, the Guggenheim, the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, among others. And it is an honor to have a team so talented, so generous, and so humble to join us today. So welcome, Marion and Michael. Thank you, Linda, for this generous introduction, and, and also thank you to be included in this lecture series that equally values engagement with the students, which we were so lucky to enjoy, and also values cross-disciplinary thinking. And Michael and I are going to share this lecture and try to unpack a series of evolving paradigms and projects, but it's worth noting that we're incredibly humbled and grateful to be able to work on your campus, which we view as an icon of valuing architecture, landscape, social realms, and places yet to be discovered and learning as something that we value ourselves. So we're going to share a few things. Michael? Um, we're going to share uh, 10 projects, and we're not quite ready to share um, the project we're working on uh, with uh, some of you in the audience, but hopefully we will. The projects are not arranged in chronological order necessarily, but they do share attributes. And I think we found over the course of our projects and over the course of our practice, one project informs the other. And sometimes you go back to an earlier project to see certain reciprocity. So hopefully you'll see certain themes emerge in the work itself. Um, I think it's an understatement to say we're living in an equally turbulent and um, unpredictable world. And um, I think, the, the, in a way, this may be a call to arms, because those of us who are thinking about larger issues, particularly in the context of the design disciplines, um, we can no longer silo ourselves, think of ourselves as engineers only, architects only, landscape architects only, planners only. We have to have a broader way of engaging each other to solve the kind of broad questions. And similarly, uh, no longer is it possible to think about the world as a kind of a, a dual condition, the artificial world or the natural world. Those two are so intertwined, virtually every square kilometer on the earth has been somehow touched. So we tend to be suspicious of unitizing solutions solutions that might suggest that there's a one-size-fits-all. We much prefer um, incremental adjusting solutions, solutions that could be implemented over the course of time, like this beautiful image of uh, the plan for Rome, which evolved over uh, three to 400 years. Um, and we're also honored to be speaking in a building designed by Fuhimiko Maki, one of our great heroes, and um, love the fact that for him, he pioneered the sense that architecture was about a network. It was about much broader set of connections. And you can see the kind of quote uh, that he made probably shortly after building this building, uh, where he talked about the links being more important. So that led us uh, to um, 
thinking about the work and uh, thinking about it in the context of the production of books, the production of polemic, the idea that um, architecture, uh, all design disciplines, in fact, should be seen as infrastructural. Uh, they aren't only about the kind of physical environment, they also induce a set of social infrastructures that are of equal importance. And as we start to think about what projects have inspired us over time, they've been curious ones. They've been ones that are not necessarily the, the tip of the architectural pyramid that's so polished into perfection that everybody knows it in silhouette and in one glance, but far richer over time and over place, places. And so what we have done with our studios and our teaching, mine at Penn, Michael's at Harvard, but also even internal to our own studio, been literally unpacking and reanalyzing a series of projects uh, that have had enduring meaning for us. And in that unpacking, literally building and rebuilding them, and these are uh, now uh, exercises that our students have done that were, Michael will talk about it a little bit later, exhibited alongside our work, uh, the Venice Biennale. But what are these things that are systemic and yet somehow have a softness to be able to connect to the environments that they are part of and maybe affect the environment that they are um, now reshaping. Uh, we're very happy to say as of two weeks ago, we are finally um, in contract with our publisher, Park Books, uh, for our next book, Drifting Symmetries, that is the title of this lecture, which is really touching on the fact that we no longer can operate in a static manner, but we need to include things. And there may be symmetries that are within it, but they're open-ended by their nature. And so part of the book unfolds some of the research that we've been doing, obviously with our uh, embassy project that we'll talk about later in, in India, we have discovered amazing things that are very old Agrasan Kiboli step well as places that have been carved into the earth to be, of course, infrastructures for water, but shade filled uh, and cascading environments for community to find themselves. And this has happened over time. So the building and rebuilding of these models in context with their cities has been a commitment to understand those relationships. And so too, Michael mentioned Maki, Fumikamoka's Hillside Terrace, a project that you know in the building that we are now, he did two buildings side by side here 40 years apart. At Hillside Terrace in Tokyo, he's done buildings over 50 years in the same place, each where the architecture and the landscape would be meaningless without the other. And the setting would be, in effect, meaningless without being locked in Tokyo's richer uh, hillside area. And the sectional topographic identity of this, like a series of MRIs, intrigues us in terms of how it unfolds and redistributes itself and recasts a piece of a city, both as a whole, but also as a place to wander in. And most of you might not immediately think Gaudi when you think of uh, the park well, but for us, it is the most infrastructurally dynamic, craft sensitive, and surprisingly felicitous place. In fact, it's a place that carves through the contours of Barcelona's elevated plateau. And in our redrawing of this, you can see on, the, on your right-hand side the idea of weaving this into its community and also understanding that that section up the upper left is a market but also collects water. So um, this is a very small project but gave us a chance to think about some of these larger um, issues and um, we chose, uh, we were invited to uh, create a pavilion at the Venice uh, Biennale, but rather than just show our work, we thought it important to show infrastructural projects that not literally inspired us, but actually uh, dealt with larger questions that were in fact foundational and inspirational. So Marion mentioned the kind of models that became part of this project, but it was also an opportunity rather than to create a singular object, to create a, a kind of place, a sort of mini piazza where people could gather. And of course, fabricating something in Venice is unique. It was fabricated um, a little bit outside of the city of Venice, um, carefully packed and unpacked uh, in the Corderia, which is a very beautiful industrial structure dating back to the 15th century. Um, but you can start to see that in the kind of chaos of the Biennale, it's a place of respite, a kind of quiet place where you can take in not only our work, but hopefully the kind of uh, larger and more systemic agendas of some of the earlier projects that we were so um, taken by. But uh, also an opportunity to think about the tectonics of structure. Here in the tradition, the great maritime building tradition 
Of Venice, it was an opportunity to explore wood. Um, wood that gets stained, uh, much like the gondolas or like the structure you see in the Corderia. And it becomes, in a way, by virtue of its skeletal nature, self-supporting. Um, and again, in this sort of transition from the larger sense of creating a space, we also wanted to bring in levels of intimacy so that, again, in the context of the large exuberance of the Venice Biennale, you could find a few quiet moments to think about something that a little bit more intimate. And so places of intimacy for us often include places of landscape. And the first place that I was taken to when I came to New York by my sister was a Brooklyn Botanic Garden. And interestingly enough, who knew in the upper view that there was anything as beautiful as the lower view, side by side and so close together, and yet seemingly so far apart. And when we were invited to uh, think about doing the visitor center, if you see that green circle near the top uh, and the middle of the garden, that was where they wanted to put a new visitor center building, and we thought that was really the wrong idea. What we wanted to do was to connect the city and the garden in something that would enable us to get over this huge line. This is Mother's Day, 42,000 people visit the garden on Mother's Day, um, and to not have to go through the turnstile that you went by one by one. So our, our hunch was that this little kiosk was actually in the right place. But if we could return to that question of city and garden, the question was, could we actually begin to weave like origami that idea of something that was 100% urban and architectural and actually have it disappear at a certain point so it was 100% landscape and woven into that context? And so you can see literally that, that Janus-like uh, chameleon uh, reading of architecture to landscape um, and also that idea of passage so that you might be guided by the light of a skylight above, outdoor but undercover, and see that 10,000 square foot green roof lead you 400 feet later to the center of the garden. And yet what really is at stake here is trying to enable the idea of the garden as a journey, as a place, to be something that unfolds in pieces. You can never see this whole building all at once, but it's an inhabitable topography at one end and 100% architecturally absent as it goes into the far end of the landscape. And yet between the, the gift store and the ticketing area really is that guiding light to the garden and literally that one moment where you can choose to go to the city on your left or the garden on your right, one of our favorite moments of choice, uh, then actually leads to the geometries that have been far more relaxed, not just because Olmsted had something to do with the shaping of this garden, but because this is probably the rarest green, uh, green cherry flowering tree and the shape of the roof is following the drip line and the shape of the building follows that drip line. Uh, but inside, Inside that journey continues, so the kind of there's always a reciprocity between walking through the building or walking alongside it. It terminates in a community room that's used for uh, lectures, conferences, musical performances. It's actually a two-sided room shaped much like a leaf and, in fact, inspired by it. Um, also, uh, somewhat serendipitous was the opportunity to take some of the ginkgos that had been on site and had been diseased to re-kiln them and line the room with the ginkgos that actually had been precisely on this site. So it's a chance to kind of establish a sense of place through the idea of reclaiming nature and allowing it to have a second life. The building's approach from two sides is actually a kind of a Mobius in a way. So you can approach it from the higher end uh, where it's seen as a one-story building. You slide through the building um, and take in the kind of, in a way, the man-made or woman-made topographies of the building that calibrate, that meter the kind of sectional difference. And then you emerge into the large and beautifully expansive cherry esplanade. So the building acts in a way as a, a sort of a machine to better understand the garden. At times, its roof in the fall uh, takes on a very beautiful golden uh, chroma. Um, and it is... Um, while it may appear to be um, a very uh, benign building, it's a very hard-working machine. It's all about gathering water, which, as we know, is extremely precious. Um, that water is kind of captured in a series of rain gardens, funneled into the Japanese pond. And at that point, it's clean enough to be reused uh, in the garden itself. So at times, the building is seen as overtly architectural, particularly in the kind of early evening 
or early morning. At times, it kind of disappears. It sort of whispers. Um, and um, it, it's a bit of a chameleon. Um, we love the idea that you can't quite tell how the building has fundamentally shaped its organization. But it, it in a way, accommodates and uh, sets up a kind of a sequence. And so what was very interesting is that that sequence through the garden was somewhat affected by the fact that the site they chose remained absent of a building after our building was done. And yet the funds ran out, of course. And so we worked with them to get a grant and a gift to be able to think about something that had come into great focus. And our question was, could we think about it with the same topographic and habitability in new terms? And so that hillside, and you're looking at directly lower left there, the project itself, was an interesting one because this was where the building was intended. And in fact, they really had done nothing to it. It tended to wash out every winter and needed to be re replanted. Um, and then at the same time, they were uh, effectively held responsible for providing ADA access that had yet to be connected relative to the subway uh, stop. This was a solution that the city thought would be fine and it could be accomplished in a very small area. And we thought we could do better. And so the question was, instead of the efficiency of an ADA ramp, what about a 1,100 foot linear walkway that is in fact a brand new garden in a place where you could wander and never see an ADA handrail and never even know that access was a concern because a garden was invented. So here you can see what we're doing is really trying to keep that hillside from eroding as we created a route or a journey with a series of precast panels that enable this kind of wandering journey to have great places to sit and wait at its ends and actually uh, arrive in that garden, going through a garden. And Toby Wolf, uh, who horticulturally created this masterwork of relaxation of plants that knew no bounds and knew no rules, um, but actually had a lot to do with the stability and the inhabitation of this uh, garden. And so you can start to see it while it looks symmetrical, it's anything but symmetrical. And in fact, it's uh, now for us a wonderful opportunity to literally extend that idea of landscape and architecture into a garden that we admire and continue uh, to find respite in. And for those of you who understand the power of open space during the pandemic, and you can see people here at that moment in this uh, particular film, this became one of the most public grounds uh, for people as our indoor worlds uh, became quieter when we were together. should say that we are the beneficiaries of an extraordinarily talented office. And so while we're here describing the projects, um, we again uh, have been really, really uh, consistently inspired by the talent in our, in our team, in our studio, but also the consultants that we've worked with. So this is a, a, a laboratory. Laboratories are often very anti-urban buildings. They're very hermetic buildings. Um, and it happens to be on the University of Pennsylvania in the engineering quad, also a, a rather bleak uh, part of the campus. So the goal was to kind of um, initially create, quite simply, a, a nanotechnology lab. But uh, through discussions with the university and through our own sort of interests, it became clear that this project had to have a much larger and broader agenda. So the site you can see uh, circled in red is at the uh, sort of the easternmost edge of the campus, really the intersection of Philadelphia itself and the campus. And the campus has this fantastic quality of uh, a series of syncopated uh, open spaces, buildings and quads talk to each other. So it was an opportunity for us to think not about creating a beautiful object building, which would have been fine, but to create a building that was a bit of a courtyard building that created a mini quad. So we took the idea of a lab and kind of twisted and wrapped it so that um, it first and foremost created a public open space, a public quad on um, uh, Walnut Street, which is a very important street that goes from the campus to inner city Philadelphia. And that kind of operation, this was taken just when the project opened. Um, the, uh, the locust trees are quite lush now, so it's a place of respite. Uh, it is, first and foremost, a public space. And the lab, in a way, takes a kind of a, takes a, a more secondary position 
to its larger urban implications and urban responsibilities. But that sort of liminal space, the kind of porch between the laboratories, which you see behind the saffron colored glass, and the courtyard become a really interesting place, a place of learning, a place of offhand encounters. And that particular glass is actually uh, scientifically uh, important for the creation of, um, uh, of some of the uh, nanotechnology uh, research that's being done. But it's also an opportunity to think about how scientists get together. And again, it's the offhand encounters that we speak so passionately about. Uh, that um, allow us to think of stairs as a sort of vertical set of living rooms or work rooms. Um, it's a place where you can see and be seen. Again, working in a laboratory is extremely um, high pressured and very, very, at times, quite dangerous. So it's important actually to get out and enjoy the kind of metrics of natural light. And finally, that route, that kind of circular ascending spiral uh, concludes in a, in a kind of multi-purpose community room a community room where you go from the courtyard of the city up through the labs, and then finally you emerge with a view both of the campus and the city. At night, the building, which is um, in a way hardly ever closes, becomes luminous, and it too becomes a participant in the activity of the city. And we'll, we'll sort of share that. Um, typically, there'd be some sound of moving cars, um, so I won't simulate that, but um, you can start to see how um, moving through the building becomes important. You're always aware of the laboratories. You're always aware of the city. And often those two worlds are antithetical to each other. And here, it's our hope to kind of bring them together in a kind of conversation. And, you know, Michael's touched on that question of conversation, and there's no place where conversation's more essential to learning than in a school of architecture and design, and you all know that here. And so when we were fortunate to win the Kent State Center for Architecture and Environmental Design competition for Kent, what was very interesting for us was, again, to pull back a little bit and not just think about what an architecture school might be, but what an architecture school in Kent could be. And if we think about the factories that were so prevalent in that area, and the factories that enabled so much to be produced and so much uh, natural light brought in in ways that didn't rely on you know, artificial lighting. Um, our hunch was that that kind of simplicity and that se sense of fabrication literally could be an underpinning for how we might think about a building for design. And so if you look at these series of diagrams, there really was that opportunity to think about how wonderful it would be if the whole loft studio experience where you're seeing and being seen and being inspired could be something that actually created a new topography for the building. And that topography is something that would unfold with studio sections and critique spaces seen together, and then classrooms, libraries, research, and even a big public walkway on the ground floor could connect everybody. And yet, it's a very simple diagram. I mean, rarely is there an opportunity on, on a site this narrow to be able, but this long, to be able to create a tapestry of a section that could connect, uh, reach up to the city on the right and reach down to the campus on the left. What became very interesting then was that uh, architecture has a need to be able to be filled with light by day, but also at night, Honestly, it's the only building on campus where everybody's still working. So why not, in fact, let those lights that have to be on also declare the kind of productive um, inquiry that's, and fabrication that's going on inside. It literally is a public street on the ground level with the cafe, the staircase riding up. You can see the event space a little bit beyond. But it is that idea of un, uh, ascending the stair and seeing into that studio immediately that lets you know that you're part of something and you belong somewhere, and you belong in a place where, quite frankly, you need to get used to your work being seen. Um, up on the upper left there, you can see the studio critique spaces, acoustically independent, but visually connected. And then you can see the kind of looking down again, so that work is always, in a sense, uh, you, you acquire that sense of peripheral vision. This was the first day. I would imagine it doesn't look anything like that now, certainly as it continues. Uh, they're beginning to uh, take liberties with our design, which is exactly what we love. Um, you can see a critique going on in the background and uh, studio reviews going on in the foreground. And yet the library itself is, is an important place to uh, be able to think and to gather. And in the middle and the heart of it is the materials library, which has its own uh, world within a world. 
Um, and yet the world within the world at Kent is one where being able to be very respectful of this particular ambiance of wood and brick and this chroma that connects the campus to the city is one that we came down to the scale of the, the campus to look at those uh, bricks and actually uh, reactivate a beehive kiln, which you can see on the left, uh, that they had apologized for that they could not keep the color of the brick consistent because the outside and the inside of the kiln heated at different temperatures. And we said, great. And in fact, we added one more uh, dimensionally challenging brick there. We created a form brick that cantilevered four inches, four and a quarter inches would have required a steel relieving angle, so it's four inches. Um, but you can see that what it does is it creates a very tactile meter so that even in the abstraction of this architectural building, which is robust in scale, the intimacy to invite uh, somebody to want to touch it is something that we take great delight in. Um, and you could also see that it created a pattern that uh, assisted some of our solar shading, but also allowed the, the, the sort of the landscape around to dematerialize in the windows and the brick itself to become luminous. And at night, for us, again, as architects and as designers, and you all know, um, the building is going to be most vibrant when it's most busy, and that's right around finals when not a single light is off. So I, I don't know if I have night shots of this project uh, being used at night, but um, a very different kind of incubator space in a way because uh, schools of design are, in fact, incubators by virtue of their very nature. Um, this was uh, Cornell University and the Technion in Israel decided to create a, a campus. This was part of Mayor Bloomberg's initiative, a tech campus, and the site that was chosen was Roosevelt Island. Um, what an incredible opportunity. How many islands are there in the middle of major cities? We can think of very few. Um, so um, extraordinary river-to-river -river views, potentially. Um, but also the reality of hurricanes, which, uh, as we all know, are becoming more frequent and um, more powerful. So how to deal with both the beauty of this site, but also the potential uh, perils and challenges. The site that was given to us was this kind of blue blob that we thought, you know, I think we could do something a little better. So we went back to Cornell and said, with such an amazing site, why not think of this building as being two-sided so that we could take the scale of the building and think of it as two buildings that in a way kind of kiss or touch each other, but also frame views both of Queens uh, looking east or Manhattan looking west. And that became the kind of genesis of the plan. The section in a way responds to the urgency of climate change. And that allowed us to think of a kind of piano nobile, uh, a level that is above the kind of flood zone. And then allowed us to put all the kind of uh, primary equipment, research equipment, above that kind of first floor, 23 um, feet above uh, the uh, flood, FEMA flood line, which was at 15. But how do you induce a level of activity in a sectional building, a building that has multiple levels? So here circulation became the kind of primary gener generator of, uh, like at, at the Penn Laboratory, a place where as you moved up through the building, there's a kind of choreography of seeing and being seen. And that sort of sense starts out um, at the kind of the building's front door, which you see on the left. And then... Um, it's an idea of aggregating a series of buildings ultimately as the campus develops around a green space. So our building is oriented so that the public areas between the two prisms um, always face uh, open views that will uh, never be obstructed. So the kind of invitation to take this very large, um, uh, significantly uh, big building, break it into two pieces allowed us to think about the kind of space in between as being the kind of social infrastructural glue, if you will. So uh, working closely with um, Jim Corner of field operations, we developed a kind of idea, the topography, again, doing everything we could to lift the primary ground plane. And that topography continues into the building where we're interested very much in how a building's topographic qualities, its sectional qualities, might start to create spaces. It then ascends, there's a, a sort of multi-leveled uh, studio uh, for uh, kind of a, um, 
interaction of a whole set of different disciplines around projects. At times, uh, you can kind of peel off the studio and take in these incredibly panoramic views. Um, and sometimes the building sort of levitates, so you never can sort of sense its scale, which is precisely what we were hoping to achieve. And then finally, there's a, the topography of the roof, uh, one of the kind of great, I think, underused opportunities as architects and as landscape architects. Um, we, I think, are all increasingly f sort of interested in this new horizon that we can create. Uh, there are about uh, 44,000 uh, square feet of solar panels that um, allow this building to uh, be energized. And finally, uh, we hope that you also see it in the context of the heroic structures of the 19th century, sort of great technological, technological achievements in their own right. So the Queensboro Bridge is a beautiful backdrop for the kind of trusses that support this building as well and allow it to kind of effectively levitate off a series of eight columns. So, you know, when you start thinking about building a campus, in the case of uh, Cornell Tech, that was a complete invention with a collection of buildings <clears throat> together shaping a campus and shaping an identity. But sometimes the question is, how do you respond to contexts that are very sensitive? And at Smith College, um, you can start to see there's a building here that looks as if it's uh, generously facing the campus, which it is. Um, but it's all about a street that connects the community together, which you can see here. And more importantly, it's one that also is a good neighbor on Main Street to a very small residential community. So that's a case of a building that toggles between expansive generosity and also intimacy that blends in with that setting. So that question of responding to a context was strong here. In other cases, it's about inventing a context that didn't exist. This is the Sci Center for Innovative Thinking at Yale University. And uh, we were uh, really thrilled to be selected to do this project that was supposed to be an addition to the building on the right or an addition to the building on the left. That's Breuer's Becton. We said, we're not about to touch that one. That's a landmark. Um, the building on the left, we said, we didn't think it was so strong necessarily to create this center for innovative thinking. So we looked at the roof of a lab right here in the middle, and it was a loading dock area behind us. And we said, what about thinking about reconstituting this roof and this big barrier of a wall between a courtyard below where the president's office is, and actually create one unified uh, open space with the Center for Innovative C uh, Thinking on top. But the real question here is that it's virtually invisible. And here we are off of Prospect with the Becton on the right and uh, the uh, Collegiate Gothic uh, SSS building on the right and Becton on the left, sorry. So what do you do? Well, we started to think about the idea of Magritte and those Magritte paintings where just a touch of light is what draws your eye towards where you might want to be. So this was our homage to Magritte and to say the building needed to reach out just to be seen enough to draw you into the center. But in that thinking, we also then wanted to create a, a campus green, if you will, because Yale has incredible quads and courtyards. We wanted to make one more that you discovered and think about it in the context of a place that also connects you uh, to the core campus and even to where the business school and engineering schools are uh, on your right. So as a connector, it needed to become a beacon as well. So you can see that we took that wall down, that concrete wall that you'd seen earlier is now taken down to create a new garden. Um, and it also becomes the prospect of what the Center for Innovative Thinking is. And as a building that's only 12,500 square feet, we still had to do something innovative. That curved glass is self-supporting. Imagine taking a piece of paper, if you hold it straight up, it falls over. If you curl it like half of a cup, it's self-supporting. And so literally this is a self-supporting uh, curvilinear glass building that then has at its center the collaboration space or studio space uh, that is shared for the shared projects where all the cross-disciplinary groups have opportunities to do projects <clears throat> that are socially motivated and scientifically promising together. And in that, they also have the ability to have some privacy or cut the glare on, on certain occasions, but that idea of emitting light and emitting that color still carries forward. And on the upper level, there are breakout spaces and meeting areas and workshop areas that are visually connected and acoustically independent, as was shared in Kent, uh, so that that world of that community is one that then also then finally unfolds as a new landscape that faces to the north here, 
And you can see it's now in dialogue rather than in isolation with the buildings around it. It is an icon and yet the most petite building and the thing that is for us truly magical when we start to think about what it means to create a context is also to create a conversation. And its last view of this project, what's very interesting to us is somehow the brutalist building of Marcel Breuer on the one side on the right, which we really admire, the, uh, the collegiate Gothic uh, Strathmore Conconia building in the distance, uh, which is much of Yale's campus. And on the left, somehow the glass has merged those two languages together to talk about what that conversation can truly be. So we'd like to say we planned it, but um, sometimes uh, um, things happen that are truly serendipitous. Um, and this was, I think, one of those gracious moments. Um, but if we move from uh, the um, Ivy Halls of Yale to uh, New Delhi, India, um, it may seem like quite a reach, but the, the, the campus, the U.S. Embassy, is in fact a campus. And um, we've been uh, struck by the beauty of the Mughal Gardens and the reciprocity between both architecture and landscape. And water's treated preciously, trees shade. Um, India is going through a very, very sort of um, serious set of environmental uh, issues. Too much water, too much drought, uh, bad air quality, and in a way it's a harbinger of things to come here. We were uh, quite taken by Edward Durrell Stone's beautiful uh, chancery building, which was the first building on the embassy uh, constructed in the late 50s. And here the environmental concerns, shade, a kind of jolly screen, were foregrounded. And it was very important in the kind of redevelopment of this embassy that uh, we felt that this building had to be preserved and uh, honored. So um, we worked with the State Department to identify uh, legacy buildings that were uh, crucial to how this campus would evolve over the next 5, 10, 50, 20 years. And you can see those buildings identified as the Ambassador's House, which is a small rectangle, and then the Chancery and Refracting Pool, which uh, is the larger of the two rectangles. And before thinking about programs, square footages, um, mechanical needs, we said that there was a kind of uh, a pattern that um, new buildings and existing buildings could start to collaborate and create. So the idea of a kind of uh, a system of a kind of a linear pathway where these oscillating entries might be positioned would create an armature, a real master plan. And that would become a kind of linear reinterpretation of a Mogul garden. It's a kind of a, a almost a, a tapis vert, a green carpet that somehow is the glue that links these multiple buildings that are being, in some cases, we're designing and are being built now. In other cases, will be built long after um, we finish our work. So here you could see the ultimate build out, but the critical uh, item is that kind of linear path that becomes the primary organizing device. And it's, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, organizing device that you would see very often in the beautiful Mughal Gardens. The other element of an embassy is the issue of protection. And here we took the idea of a wall, which is often seen in pejorative terms, and thought about it as the kind of legacy of Indian architecture would as a series of protected elements that establish precincts that go from the very public to the semi-public here, where you would get your visas, to the much more uh, private areas where a lot of the embassy work is done, and then finally to the ceremonial areas. So like a flower, it has a series of petals that slowly kind of fold and unfold. The building is very sectional, and Marion will talk about that, but it's also an opportunity to think about the relationship of canopies, both vegetal and mineral. So the vegetal Dalonyx trees here provide a shade that is then reciprocated in the kind of horizontal canopy of our building on the left. And what's interesting here is it's the beginning of a path that rather than being a straight line through the campus that has, as it has been, it's a wandering line uh, that allows you for your first arrival uh, through the gates to be able to see the historic embassy by Edward Durrell Stone and then wander towards the new building that we are introducing to the campus. And what you could start to see here though is they had a beautiful reflecting pool 
Um, in the distance, you can see the Edward Durrell Stone uh, building. And to the left, you can see our new building. But as you can imagine, the amount of uh, evaporation that can occur in India with this made this uh, iconic piece less than sustainable. And so the question was, how do you preserve that but make it do more work? And so what you're seeing here is that the layer of water is held very thinly in the top layer now, and then we have a large detention tank that we can, in times where we have uh, less water, and monsoon season is not one of them, we can collect during those seasons and use that water on the campus uh, and not find that we've had too much for evaporation. So these sustainable subsurface questions go a little bit further. As we start to think about the section of the building, and this truly is conceived in section, uh, we were very keenly aware that we didn't want the building to overwhelm or overscale uh, the historic uh, structures. And so much of the uh, project itself exists one level below that garden level with uh, courtyards and light wells bringing light in, but also enabling us to have some things that are sectionally independent for security purposes. So you can start to see these spaces um, and that sectional cut into a garden so that the workspace that connects the historic chancery to the new chancery is one that's shared and landscape is the connector, um, but it's also allowing these two structures to have independence above. And uh, the honorific gallery where people, in a sense, are welcomed with food and, uh, in the distance, uh, dining uh, greeting, there's still that sense that those walls that Michael described as he unfolded that diagram, that the idea that sometimes a wall that holds a garden or triumphal music um, um, can also then bring you inside and become a very unique and very special place. And that stone, of course, is something that we, we look towards Edward Earl Stone's building for further inspiration as that translation of a colonnade and a jolly screen as the two elements that were both uh, filtering light but also uh, making a nod to the inspiration. So for us, as we started to weave these notions of the vertical, the, the, the vertical cadence of columns and the jolly screen, the problem with the jolly screen is that you really can't see out. So what would happen if we could both have sun protection and really manage to cut the direct sunlight and allow this to really enable us to control that environment, but also add a level of um, interest and tactility that could start to have this rich dialogue uh, across these two historic buildings and contemporary buildings. So you can start to see both, you'll see a few drawings throughout here. Michael and I, um, we tend to discover that when we talk together and draw together and build models and tear them apart, and Patrick's grinning. So, okay, this is shorthand. Patrick Armacost here working on our project here, a, also a WashU graduate, knows that we have debates that are sometimes more vocal in the office then I'm portraying them. Nonetheless, drawings are where we engage those dialogues. And in these dialogues, we are able to start to get at the essence of things. And particularly in charcoal, where you cannot be too perfect, it enables that open-ended discussion to think about what, in this case, water, the drums of the walls, or the cadence of a jolly screen, can come together and even start to think about that experience of inside and outside. And in this case here, the canopy, just as in the historic chancery building, preconditions the outside air with shade. But in this case, the water, rather than being remote and formal in a circular pool, is brought towards the building. So that evaporative cooling is something that actually preconditions the experience of arriving in the building, which is not held up high on a plinth, but in fact is that grade. And that uh, idea that this, that this building is, rather than elevated, is part of that path, again, for us, enables that intimacy that Michael described in the Mughal Gardens, that connection to garden, landscape, and architecture is one that we are excited. It's under construction now, um, and we uh, hope in a number of years uh, you will be able to see what this looks like. Um, and yet this idea of kind of uh, inventing sometimes things don't exist means that sites often have uh, agendas that precede you um, that are quite important. In the case of the Olympic Sculpture Park at Seattle, the Port of Seattle and the use of that water's edge uh, with trains that could enable trade, uh, with piers that could enable exchange, and to a topographically dynamic uh, grid of a city. And in a sense, like every city that we can think of, uh, and you could see East River, New York, Alaska Way, Seattle, cities were prevented from having any connection to their water because industry succeeded. So 
what does one do when the icon of a place like Seattle is known for its water and yet there was no way to get there? Well, the Seattle Art Museum decided they didn't know either, so they were gonna hold an international competition to be able to ask what that might mean to be able to connect uh, through art and sculpture the city to the water's edge. Now, if you look at this, you realize it's not one site. There's an arterial highway for trucking. Um, there's a train line. Uh, it turned out there was a failing seawall. Uh, it's fully contaminated because it was a site of Union Oil of California. Um, and uh, it had a very, very tight budget and a topographical grade change of 40 feet. So we thought, wow, awesome. You know, we've got to you know, jump in. Um, and yet, what you're gonna see here was that it wasn't so much about uh, doing the two artistic bridges that they had imagined sculptors would do, but in fact, constructing a landform that could wander from the city to the water's edge and create multiple environments in a finite nine acres. Now, again, you hear about the debates uh, that I just mentioned in the other drawings. Sometimes the drawings are very, very scratchy because there's just way too many things going on at once. We call this the infrastructure x-ray because, well, the city's going through it, the topography is there, there's a failing seawall, and there's salmon habitat to be considered if we can get that federal grant. Um, and there was a, a whole question of even a, a, a trolley barn that we needed to think about. So one needed to think systemically and simultaneously on every single layer, whether it was the encapsulating wells that uh, were necessary for remediation, where it was the train lines, uh, the trolley stop, uh, cars, parking, trucks, uh, water collection, um, uh, and even a path and landscape, and not to mention an infrastructure to support art that we have yet to imagine. We were lucky enough that they were actually working on the downtown building uh, for the Seattle Art Museum, and so we got 200,000 cubic yards of earth for free, and that helped us out tremendously with a very challenged budget. But you can start to see literally the, the shaping of a site was as important here as any piece of architecture. And the, the pavilion, if you will, which is a Kunsthalle that you can see in the upper edge was part of, but not the essential part. The essential part was really constructing this uh, destination through the lens of art to be able to connect to the Olympic Mountains beyond, which is why it's called the Olympic Sculpture Park. Because it was so expensive to build, we couldn't have the, for, the board form concrete walls that were in our first uh, vision. The, the walls exceeded the budget of the whole project. So this is uh, effectively highway construction at its best, MSC or mechanically stabled earth, uh, which you can see behind with the gabion baskets, and then overlapping precast concrete walls to slip over each other so that the seismic activity, which can happen here, is one that wouldn't destroy the walls in place, but in fact create an interesting pattern or a foundation by which we could see something like Calder's Eagle or the Olympic Mountains beyond. And even the diagram for the building itself is one that is too also an unfolding landform itself, parking below, Kunsthalle inside, and a passage across where at that very moment where we didn't want to erase or hide all the infrastructure but somehow give you an awareness of it, you might not know without this point that you are dead center of an arterially statewide trucking route. So what, uh, what we loved is the simultaneity of these different sort of modes of movement that um, rather than cancel each other out would have a kind of a, uh, an interwoven quality uh, to them. Um, so there's the, the kind of uh, Elliott, uh, the wide body highway that sort of uh, slides through the city and here the sort of sense is that even at 60 miles an hour you can um, take in uh, a little bit of the art and, and maybe even slow down a bit. Um, or if you uh, love trains, which uh, interestingly enough, it turned out that there's a huge train spotting community that became vocal allies of the park, you could take in the metro liners that go from LA all the way up to um, Vancouver. Uh, and in a way, it was interesting that the great sculptor Richard Serra loved these, thought they were kinetic sculptures in and of themselves. So there's a sense of beauty in the ability to move through. And in this case, also to work with uh, extraordinary artists like uh, Teresita Fernandez, who did this beautiful throw fence uh, called Seattle Cloud Cover. But it's also the reclamation of um, the waterfront, which was so important to um, 
the peoples who uh, lived uh, in Seattle, um, you know, a couple hundred years ago. And uh, the sort of sense of reclaiming salmon, uh, reclaiming the ability to touch water was crucial. And you can start to see this sort of playful array of logs. This was after a storm. So there's a sort of sense of embracing the unpredictable. We as architects always want to kind of control everything. But here, it was a, a sort of an opportunity to kind of think about the play of time and how it might shape an environment. This beach is actually precisely designed by uh, several uh, hydrological engineers that we work closely with to induce uh, uh, salmon habitat. And happily, um, this uh, sort of uh, little pocket beach has been uh, researched by the University of Washington now for 10 years, and you can start to see that um, juvenile salmon are actually coming back. So we think of architecture, uh, we think of design, um, and in some ways, this is most felicitous for us. Uh, never would we have imagined to be thinking about a kind of subaqueous architecture. But it is, in a way, an opportunity to think of the park as a, a place that wanders from the city to the water's edge. And um, even the kind of afterlife, again, thinking about projects that are, in a sense, uh, always reinventing themselves we were fortunate enough to uh, have won the Veronica Rudge Green, which allowed us to give back, in this case, a significant amount of money to um, the Olympic Sculpture Park uh, and the foundation to uh, bring in a, a whole set of programs to underserved communities. So we love the sense that, again, this builds on what we were talking about, which is a kind of social infrastructure. So here you see the park kind of uh, probably about five or six years after. We worked with a number of engineers, Charles Anderson, um, MKA, and again, a project like this is the result of an extraordinarily large collaborative effort. So uh, I won't say anything for the film because sound is important. Um, often we don't think of the power of sound in architecture and in environments. Isn't she cute? <laughs> so uh, I love the uh, introduction that defined this project as sticky. This is sticky urbanism, sticky design. Um, this is uh, a competition we won uh, recently and it's still very much in the throes of, of uh, schematic design. Um, La Brea is an amazing and very unusual place. It's actually a, um, a UNESCO a geologic site. Um, it happens to be in the middle of LA, a city that defines itself as a city of the future, and yet the La Brea tar pits are all about the past. So there's this kind of fantastic and very surreal juxtaposition. Um, tar keeps bubbling up. As you know, L.A. got its fortunes through oil, and that oil is still still there, but revealing uh, extraordinary secrets about the Pleistocene, which was the last era of intense climate change. So the research that's now being done on site is extraordinarily relevant to what we're likely to face over the next 50, 100 years. Um, but it's a site, if we think of it, uh, as the kind of geomorphology of the area. It's uh, linked to the Santa Monica um, and to the hills around uh, LA. Um, it happens to be almost dead center, the sort of belly button along Wilshire. Um, also, um, it is part of a kind of emerging cultural district where there's Renzo Piano's uh, Cinema Museum, there's Zumthorpe's uh, LACMA and then La Brea, which is a much more of a hybrid project. It's both a museum, it's a valuable bit of open space in a city that has very little truly public open space, and it's an active site of research. So what to do? Well, part of the, I think, the great value of what we do as architects, designers, landscape architects, is to read a site 
to see what it might tell us. And what seemed to emerge was the sense that the site was organized around three precincts, um, a site where uh, one of the precincts was all about research, active paleontological research, community and culture, which was a museum that needed to expand, so the sort of the brief was to expand the museum. And then finally, there's the sort of tar pit itself on Wilshire, which is all about the kind of spectacular. Um, rather than think of these three as independent precincts, which is currently the case, they don't amount to much, we thought, how could the whole be greater than the sum of the parts, to use that sort of uh, analogy. So there's a triple loop that connects Wilshire, the city of LA, the museum, and the research pit. So you can alternately see all three of those as part of a visitor experience. So that kind of triple Mobius allowed us to think about the site and uh, the architectural elements and to start to compose them in a way where they added up to uh, a greater whole. So you can start to see the kind of existing page museum, which is the museum with the space frame on it. So we're extending that and there's a kind of circular form that becomes part of the museum extension. We're creating a large oval green, a bridge across the lake pit, and then connecting the active paleontological research sites. And as Michael mentioned, um, this is a case where the site has so many extraordinary things, and yet there's something less than extraordinary about the arrival. A little more asphalt than tar right here. Uh, but actually, the Page Museum is was conceived as an earthwork with the frieze that actually uh, shows all the animals and, and mammoths and mastodons and short-faced bears that uh, have been pulled literally from this site and only from this site. And yet, as we started to think about that uh, arrival, in LA more than any other place, shade equity is truly at stake. And so to actually have a canopy that is about that invitation to say that your experience here begins at the edge of Wilshire Boulevard and somehow inside the museum. And then that uh, idea of a shaded arrival experience is one that, as Michael mentioned, guides you to an unfolding and continuous experience, a bridge over the lake pit on the left or an arcing uh, view towards the, the sort of uh, community green and as we start to think even these landscapes, uh, these are inventions now where there's the idea of actually new, um, if you will, Pleistocene landscapes that give you a window into that uh, lost language. You can also see here uh, the idea of maybe offering shade that uh, where the excavation is occurring, those in those pits, and even those that might gather to see what's happening also have that signature benefit of shade where trees cannot be grown. And so here's that shaded viewing pit at pit 91. Um, and it, if you go there, uh, you will find yourself staring for hours at the most incremental scraping away of debris and matrix that they call to reveal those skeletons. And yet it's truly a setting for community engagement. And if you are to walk under the Zumthor building, uh, which is now careening over Wilshire Boulevard, this is a view that you will see, which is that carving into the hillside for once to reveal uh, the incredible collection inside rather than to conceal it. And, and yet, as we've extended, and you can see our expansion uh, on the one side, we've also been able to think about section in unique ways, almost that idea of shaping um, a destination through the earth as opposed to superimposing one upon it. That idea of magical unfolding uh, that one might be able to get into that world and somehow be connected with it is also one that that intimate world of science opens up to the idea of spectacle in the evening so that imagine uh, the equivalent of drive-in movie, you could actually go there and see careening across this uh, screen a series of, in this case, dire wolves, uh, you know, howling, if you will, across the LA landscape. And so that idea, though, of mystery, of surprise, of, of topographic unfolding and urban connection is one where the fictional, and you could see that on the right, those are existing, those fantastic uh, mammoths and mastodons that have been cast into the lake put just to let you know how things were drawn and permanently preserved for our benefit, uh, um, but maybe not for theirs, um, is one where we're actually, rather than keeping you at the edges behind a fence, we're pulling a bridge so that you are, in fact, uh, leaving the city behind so that you're led into a new world of time. And so that idea of a new world of time comes into focus in interesting ways here at Longwood Reimagined, currently under construction now on a 1,200-acre estate uh, that had founded by uh, Pierre DuPont 
is a place that had been a private uh, celebration of landscape and architecture and conservatories that has now been made open to the public. Now, what's so interesting here is that that ridgeline where you saw that aerial ridgeline, the concentration of the conservatories, was one where it also had uh, a larger relationship, in this case, to uh, the Abandi uh, rolling hills. And so we started to think, as we did with BBG, is there something about the way one could shape this site for many, many projects and not superimpose too much architecture? But with the parking lot and the production greenhouses that had, uh, had gone past their productive life, uh, we actually worked on a master plan for a number of years with Longwood uh, to think about what might be a new conservatory and a new way to conceive of these, these grounds that uh, uh, expand up to 27 acres for the precinct that we're working in. So again, you can see the main conservatory on the upper right was fantastic, but the production greenhouses and parking were less than revelatory about that dream of landscape, architecture, and celebration coming together. So you can start to see our work here, and we're working uh, very closely, too, with Reed Hildebrand to conceive of this landscape and this uh, magical unfolding as a place where uh, that question of being able to see in the distance and through the trees, our source of inspiration here for the conservatory, so that there's no columns uh, and beams in trees, and why would we have columns and beams in our conservatory? And as we start to look at that conservatory itself, you can see that literally the columns uh, stretch out to pick up the spans of this unfolding crinkled roof. We call it the crystalline ridge, rebuilding the whole ridge line that had been flattened, if you will, to accommodate structures. And also being able to effectively multiply that magical setting inside was one there. You can see this sketch where the idea of connecting the inside and the outside of literally an architectural grove of columns weaving in with trees and nature. Uh, again, you could see the threading of the water that is on the outside into this tapestry of unfolding gardens. And even the water and the structure and the bridging is something where inside and outside, and yet the magic inside is something that you can see unfolding. You see Reed Hildebrand's tapestry of plantings making their way into the water and onto land so that there's ambiguity about where you stand and where you're experiencing things. And they too are experimenting as, as we speak, as are we, to see how the uh, effectively the, the kind of operations of sustainability can be coming into focus. So the idea that uh, we all talk about sustainability, but in some ways it's sort of central, and I won't spend a lot of time describing the diagram, but you can start to see um, how the uh, kind of unfolding roof allows us to capture water. So every drop of water is captured reused for irrigation. But also the topography of the roof recalls the kind of Brandywine Valley. So there's a, a topographic agenda to the roof. And the building in a way lives and breathes effectively, uh, opening its uh, sort of uh, portals like gills on a fish. There are a series of 10 um, earth ducts that use the kind of thermal uh, gradient of the earth to uh, both heat uh, in the wintertime and cool in the summertime. So there's a, a kind of a sectional agenda that is not only sustainable, but for us generates a kind of an aesthetic to uh, the architecture of the uh, conservatory. Um, again, the water is always reused, replenished off the roof so that the sort of magic of glass and water become, um, in a way, agents for a more sustainable idea. You can see the, the sort of walls of the conservatory open up depending on the time of day and the temperature so that we can get a kind of chimney effect. And we love the sense that the building in a way breathes. You'll start to see it sort of mechanically uh, close itself and open up like a series of lungs. So this is a very recent photo taken last week. Um, so you can see the structure is a series of moment frames like the beautiful trees, the uh, lay of sycamores, the grove of sycamores, uh, in the distance, there's a kind of reciprocal call and response between the vegetal and the mineral. And um, Longwood is also known for its floral displays. So the structures are organized so that virtually every beam can sustain a floral display. So it becomes, a, in a way, a living museum. And uh, again, opportunities to work with Reed Hildebrand so that there are areas inside the conservatory that oscillate between the grand and the intimate, the kind of 
uh, sparkle of brightness and the cool of shade. And then, of course, at night, uh, the sense is that this would be a glass lantern, literally uh, or metaphorically um, floating on water. So this is our last uh, project that we'll share. So we thank you for being so patient. Um, this is a project that's been ongoing for about 10 years. Um, Hunters Point Waterfront Park on New York's East River um, was an industrial site, but uh, extraordinary views uh, of Manhattan and the icons of Manhattan. And like many um, reclaimed sites has had a sort of set of multiple histories from um, extraordinarily fertile wetlands uh, in pre-colonial times to the urbanization and then the abandonment of waterfront sites. So like many North American cities, there's been a sort of abdication of responsibility for how to handle these. Now, as we mentioned with Roosevelt Island, there's also the challenge of uh, flooding and hurricanes, which you see here in this very touching photo by uh, Iwan Bon, uh, the impact of which was felt in the whole metropolitan area. It's a highly engineered site. We've been working with Arup, who are the engineers, and SWA Balsley, a uh, collaboration with us and SWA Balsley. Um, and again, it points out the fact that virtually every bit of open space in some ways has been touched. But about 10 years ago, we were uh, working with what was then uh, a novel idea, which was to kind of reclaim waterfronts from hard armored edges to uh, kind of a softer idea of infrastructure. And of course, that's an idea that fortunately has caught on, but at the time was rather unique and radical. So the idea that rather than fighting each storm, how do we, like jujitsu, turn the force of nature into something that was more positive. So the primary uh, green is concealing a giant um, reservoir to contain water. And in fact, when Hurricane Sandy came, this park was about 98% finished. Water was captured and drained in through the kind of turf into a giant cistern and then was slowly released with only the damage to a couple trees. So in a way, it proved to the New York City Parks Department that this was an opportunity to think about sustainability as not only a place of uh, natural forces, um, but also uh, sustainability in terms of a social agenda. So at times, the playing field is very quiet. There are about 4,000 affordable units of housing that are being built that use this park. Again, shade is extremely important, and this canopy does a number of things. It captures water in the pleats, but also hosts a series of photovoltaic cells, so this part of the park is a kind of net zero. It's a place for intermodal transportation, from water taxi to bicycle to car. Um, and you can start to see the kind of in the pleasures of uh, hopefully what we think is interesting. Geometry is a hardworking project is performative in its foundational nature. Um, you can start to see how the park plays out in terms of active areas. Mary will talk a little bit about the more passive areas. Of uh, We've reintroduced uh, a beach, which used to be there, again, in pre-colonial times, um, and it's become this sort of fantastic magnet, as you can imagine, for kids, right? Water and sand. Um, but also an acknowledgement of the industrial character, so we were able to reuse a lot of the railroad ties and some of the board formed concrete. But it's a way in which we can kind of capture the view because as you know, views don't exist until they're framed and captured. So that sense of capturing uh, a view over time becomes uh, paramount. And yet this was one of those projects that had funding challenges. So part one was completed. And oddly enough, while we had designed the whole park, it took another, oh, I don't know, almost 10 years to get it really rolling again to do phase two. Now what was so interesting for us is that all the active recreation could occur on the first phase because it was flat. But this had a 30 foot grade change sort of marked throughout this area as landfill because the excavated tunnels had created this. So our question was, could we enable that to become a place that would have the spectacle of being above and looking out on the city and also enable you to get intimately close to the water? Now we had major <coughs> obligations to cr create uh, flood barriers so that the, <coughs> the newly designed upland community wouldn't be affected by it. And so that became for us an opportunity to think about something as dramatic as a ship's hull that lets you know that high up there, there's a place to move, to see across at a grand scale, and also something very, very close with the wetland. 
that you might connect to in new ways. So we were fortunate to be working with Arab, but it, they did say it's the first twisted cantilevered structure that they had worked on that terminated uh, with vistas of Manhattan. And you could see it was fabricated off site by shipbuilders and brought down to the site and laid in place uh, in a very short order. And what was so remarkable about that activity was it also restored some of the grade that had been lost. Yet for us, I think this view really um, states the thing that we're most excited about, which is that you could simultaneously literally jog on the water's edge, if you will, in this protective wetland, or actually had this dramatic and almost infrastructural scale of prospect beyond to the city. We were lucky that it was recently exhibited at MoMA as part of their uh, architecture now, New York New Publix. And yet for us, what was so compelling about that is that MoMA decided to say that there are unconventional architectural projects that have more uh, impact on cities than some conventional buildings. And indeed, this is a case where uh, you could start to see that unconventional cantilever, if you will, overlooking uh, a newly restored wetland that had been lost uh, over 150 years ago and protected in this case by a causeway or in this case by a carved away area to a new island, uh, which you'll see in a film that closes. And that idea that you could literally have a moment in, in, in the city to feel like you're walking on water and in many cases, as you think about that fortified, uh, the ideal medieval city that you saw, Michael showed those fortified symmetrical cities. It's the very same principle of a fortified edge here. But again, if you start to think about our tidal drifting symmetries, it's not to fortify and keep out, but to wander and enable other things to flourish. And so here you are in the prospect of that pier, the wood boardwalk finally uh, reaching out to that edge. And as you start to think about what it means uh, to be a park at the edge of a city, it's sometimes the soccer field, sometimes the ferries that come and go. Um, in some cases, it is discovering that it's being used in ways that uh, get colonized by the cafe or used as an outdoor gym by others. Um, <laughs> and, and yet that idea of being part of the city and being part of nature all at once, uh, for us, is that all at once uh, that truly is for us where the value of architecture, landscape, and urbanism can endure. So I'll close now with uh, some words that uh, really speak to the title, which is this question about uh, perfection and imperfection. And for us, rather than symmetries that have static perfection as their goal, we're interested in designing places that are uh, open to change uh, and yet somehow deeply interconnected with their sites and their communities. And at this time right now, when our social, political, and natural worlds seem to be <clears throat> falling apart in front of us, our hope is that with the kind of guise of drifting symmetries that somehow we can invite new connections, new reciprocities <clears throat> between seemingly incompatible forces and enabling, we hope, to invent places of enduring value. Thank you. How much time do you have? <laughs> um, you know, uh, of course you saw in, in a little, around an hour, um, successes because our, our failures where we probably learn the most and cry the most, often those are the places where we learn the most as well. And we've entered uh, a number of competitions and lost. Uh, we've come in second several times. So you saw the ones where we prevailed, but the, I think that the, great limbering exercises of competitions is that they're asking questions that are broader 
And so our hunch is that our failures are usually our best lessons after we recover from our tears. Yeah, I, I just to add something too is, uh, you know, we, we kind of think you, you can produce architecture or landscape instantly. And the collaborators that we've worked with constantly remind us that that's not the case. So restoring salmon habitat took some time and it took monitoring and adjusting the, uh, the uh, amount of kelp, for example. Um, so that didn't suddenly happen, uh, you know, off of a Revit model that you suddenly handed over. It really uh, meant being in the field and working with a series of aquatic scientists uh, over a period of time. Um, that's a great question, and both Michael and I have been teaching and practicing simultaneously ever since we began. In fact, we didn't take a salary for the first three years of our practice because we didn't make any money, but teaching did keep us subsidized. But I think what we discovered is that uh, what we love about teaching, particularly because we're, we're both teaching cross-disciplinary studios, um, is that the questions that we want to ask ourselves at a very rapid pace are often on projects that occur over very, very long durations. And so to be able to have this accelerated intensive environment, and you saw those projects that we were sharing uh, in the early part where we were looking at uh, Agrasan Kiboli, Kaju Bridge, um, uh, the Riverwalk in Ljubljana, um, even the Sydney Opera House, not for its shells, but for its subsurface connection to the cities. These are ways that we start to both teach ourselves and teach our students to think more broadly about where architecture begins and where the city extends it, along with the landscape, and that we bring back to our work. There's also a selfish reason. Students often don't um, take exactly what we have to uh, say for, uh, for granted and often question what we have to say. So there's something liberating, um, it may sound perverse, uh, being questioned by students. It keeps us agile, it keeps us focused, um, and often, you know, when you practice for a long period of time, you need that kind of um, questioning that comes in the context of an academic milieu. So it's valuable, it keeps us on our toes. You know, that's such a super uh, question, a really important one that we think a lot about, especially as we think about building on campuses. Uh, here at Wash U, we're thinking about it a lot. And our hunch is that people need to feel welcomed en route to take a detour to a place that they want to be, where they can see and be seen, or in fact, retreat a little bit and maybe overlook, but be part of a place that's alive and vibrant. Um, and the idea that it feels natural and inevitable is easy on one floor, challenging when you have multiple levels. So sight lines and generous stairs and other things that make it feel natural to connect to a topography that is not just at a single level like a landscape, uh, but intimate and, and lined and, and surprising, starts to be that nuance. And I think that there's no answer because it will be different in each setting, but natural light and landscape seem to play very heavily in our thinking along with movement. Questions? Yeah. 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 Well, it's interesting. I was chatting with some students, and I'll, I'll turn this over to Marion too. Um, I grew up in, uh, very fortunate to grow up in Rome, and you could walk around the city of Rome, and you'd never uh, stop and say, well, that's a building, and this is a piazza. Those two were completely in dialogue, same with kind of the great gardens, uh, both the villa and the garden were always one. So it was always a puzzle to me when I went to uh, Cornell 
um, there was always a sort of distinction. Fortunately, the landscape studio was right next to the architecture studio, but by osmosis, what's happening here, which I think is so, um, so much in alignment, by osmosis that happened. And um, our very first project was actually a park. It was a competition we won. And we didn't think about, well, is this a discipline that we shouldn't be uh, thinking about and shouldn't love? Um, so in a way, you, you, sometimes you kind of back into things, uh, which I think was very much in our case. Yeah, and I think just to add to that, our first, our practice began by winning two competitions back to back. We entered them because the questions that they were asking were far larger than an architectural question. And that's where we felt ourselves drawn to was where the boundaries of the design thinking couldn't stop at the edge of the building. And so that kind of momentum, obviously, I went to UVA undergrad with the graduate uh, landscape studio right next door. Of course, we were all dating each other. Um, but the, the, the whole point, though, was that this sense of landscape and architecture having so much in common became, I would say, you know, uh, instrumentally strong through that kind of educational lens. This is always the best part, but, no, but it's late. 